the next unit, we're going to talk about labor supply. We're going to develop a model called the income leisure trade-off model. But I want to take a few minutes uh, prior to getting into that material to either review or give you an overview of indifference curves and budget constraints. This is something that you may have covered in your micro principles class, or something that you may not. Not everyone covers this anymore, and in many textbooks, it's been relegated to an appendix. So I'm going to take a little time today to cover indifference curves uh, in their sort of generic, general sense, go through some main characteristics of indifference curves, and in that, in doing that, prepare for the next unit on the income leisure trade-off model and labor supply. So first. Indifference curves, what are they and how are we going to represent them graphically? Well, we're starting with a very simple model. Simple. Think about an economic model, right? a simplification of reality, where there are only two goods. You may have done this with the production possibilities frontier, when you think back to a world with only two goods and how you could produce more of one and give up uh, you know, uh, some of the other. Now we're going to think about um, how much would I like to have. So from the consuming side, how much uh, happiness or utility, satisfaction, do I get from consuming a bundle that includes the two goods in the world? So let's get a little more concrete. All right, so we'll pick up in my world with only two goods. If I had to live in a world with only two goods, here they are, pizza and Pepsi. And so in my world, I put one, I put pizza on the vertical axis and Pepsi on the horizontal axis. Some of you who are of legal age might argue that there are other things that go with pizza that could uh, be down here. You can write whatever you want uh, in, your, uh, in your scratch paper um, as you draw this out. Now, let's suppose I start with some initial endowment of pizza and Pepsi. So I'm just gonna pick a point, and then on my plane, this represents some allocation of pizza and some number of, of we'll say, glasses of Pepsi or cans of Pepsi. So let's suppose that this is five cans of Pepsi and seven slices of pizza. What I want to think about to draw my indifference curve or to develop my indifference curve is another allocation of points um, that I could consider with this one. And between the two, I'd be indifferent. That is, I wouldn't prefer this collection over some other collection and I wouldn't prefer the other collection over this one. Both of them would give me the same level of what we'll call utility or happiness or satisfaction. Um, so to get there, let's think about what I would take in trade to, to be just as happy, to be indifferent between this one and some other, some other combination. So now there's, there's me, imagine another person. You come along, and it just so happens that you have lots of Pepsi, but you have very little pizza. And you would like to buy some of my pizza. Now, how are you gonna buy my pizza? Well, we'll strike a deal, and you'll have to pay me in something else. I remember in our simplified model, there are only two goods in the world, so if I'm gonna sell you pizza, you're gonna pay me in Pepsi, right? So that's how we'll make our trade. So you come along and you say, um, hey Smith, I'd like to buy a slice of your pizza. Um, would you sell me some, and at what price uh, would you sell it to me? Now, I'm not, in this example, in this uh, illustration, I'm not trying to make a big profit. I'm just trying to figure out how much Pepsi would I take in exchange for one slice of pizza to be equally happy, to be indifferent between the two bundles. So if I give up a slice of pizza that takes me down to six, the question is, how much Pepsi would I require? Well, I might say I might trade one slice of pizza for roughly one Pepsi in this situation. And if this is the case, then so let's say here six, right, if I give up a slice of pizza and I sell it for one can of Pepsi, I'm now at 0.66 in my plane, and I'm saying between these two points, I'm indifferent. I'm just as happy. They both give me the same level of utility or satisfaction. And then you come along again and say, look, I'm still hungry. I'd like to buy some more of your pizza. You say, would you sell me another slice of pizza for a can of Pepsi? Because remember, we'll just suppose that you have lots of Pepsi. You have a big, you have a big supply of Pepsi. You want to buy my pizza. I say, well, I have six and six. If I traded one more, I only have five slices of pizza, but I would gain Pepsi. How much Pepsi would I require? Maybe I'd sell for one, or maybe I'd take a little bit more than one. Um, let's go ahead and say that I, I would trade for one right here. And so now I'm at five 
slices of pizza and seven uh, cans of Pepsi. But what if you wanted more? What if you wanted to buy another slice of pizza for me? Smith, I'd like to buy another slice of pizza. How much would you charge in Pepsi? And remember, this is not uh, to make me better off. This is just how much would I charge to be equally well off, to be just as happy. I'd say, well, if you want me to go down to four slices of pizza and I already have seven cans of Pepsi, I'm not going to trade one for one anymore. Remember, because the last time I was on the fence, I was like, maybe I'd want a little bit more than that. I might want one and a half or two cans of Pepsi in exchange for this slice of pizza. If you think back to micro, if you get a diminishing marginal utility from additional units, then the more Pepsi I have, right, the smaller the value I place on the last unit. And the fewer slices of pizza I have, the higher the value I, I place on that last or marginal unit. So if you want me to go down to four slices of pizza, I might require two cans of Pepsi in exchange. And what if you wanted to buy more? What if you wanted me to go down to three slices of pizza? I might take, 10, 11, 12, I might take three cans of Pepsi in exchange. And now I have a lot of Pepsi. Right? I have 12 cans of Pepsi. I only have three slices of pizza. And can you see how if you want me to decrease, if you want to buy even more Pepsi, I'm going to, or um, more pizza, if you want to buy more pizza for me, cause me to give up more pizza, I'm going to require even larger quantities of Pepsi in exchange. And what if we went the other direction? What if we started back at this point and started trading the other way and said, well, you came along and said, I'd like to buy some of your Pepsi. Will you sell me uh, some Pepsi? I'll pay you in pizza. Well, if I already had seven slices of pizza and five Pepsis, I like to consume them together right, in some, some ratio. And so would I sell you um, a can of Pepsi for just one slice of pizza? No, if you want me to give up my fifth can of Pepsi and go down to four, I might charge you two slices of pizza, or one and a half, or something greater than one. Right? And so you can see I have the same thing up here. And if I thought about this not just with whole units, but with partial slices, half a slice of pizza, a third of a can of Pepsi, if I opened up the increments a bit, you could find other combinations in here that might make me just as happy, or give me the same amount of utility uh, as this initial starting allocation. And so when I put all of these together, I love these sort of infinite combinations, pizza and Pepsi together, I get what we call an indifference curve. And a particular indifference curve describes all the combinations of the two goods in our model that make you just as happy. Between all of these combinations, I'm indifferent. I don't have a preference for this one over this one, over this one. And they all make me equally happy. And that's the thrust of the indifference curve. Now, there are several uh, important characteristics of indifference curves, and that's what we're going to develop um, next.